The next day, he kept his wife under careful surveillance to make sure no one approached her or told her anything of the news from Caria. For himself, he thought of the following way of defending his interests. At just that time, Pharnaces, the governor of Lydia and Ionia, was on a visit there. He was considered the most important of the governors appointed by the king over the coastal regions. Dionysius went to him. He was a personal friend and asked for a private interview. Sir, he said, please help me and help yourself. Mithridates, who is a wretched villain and jealous of you, was my guest. Now he is trying to destroy my marriage. He has sent letters to my wife, along with money, to provoke her to adultery. Then he read the letters and explained Mithridates' design. Pharnaces was glad to hear his story, partly on Mithridates' account, no doubt, since their proximity had several times caused friction between them, but mainly because of his passion. For he too was ardently in love with Calerho. It was on her account that he kept visiting Miletus and inviting Dionysius to banquets along with his wife. So he promised to help him as much as he could and wrote a confidential letter. Pharnaces, the satrap of Lydia and Ionia, sends greetings to his master Artaxerxes, the king of kings. Dionysius of Miletus is your slave, like his ancestors before him, and a loyal and zealous friend to your house. He has complained to me that Mithridates, governor of Caria, who has been his guest, is trying to seduce his wife. He is bringing great discredit on your government. In fact, it is causing disturbance. Any improper behavior in a satrap is reprehensible, but this is particularly so. Dionysius is the most powerful of the Ionians, and his wife's beauty is celebrated, so this outrageous behavior cannot escape notice. When this letter arrived, the king read it to his friends and discussed with them what to do. Different views were expressed. Those who were envious of Mithridates, or coveted his satrapy, thought that a design on the wife of a man of distinction should not be overlooked. The more phlegmatic among them, and those who, oh, phlegmatic among them, and those who respected Mithridates, and they were numerous and highly placed, did not like the idea of ruining a respected man on the basis of a report of misbehavior. Opinions were evenly balanced. The king made no decision that day and postponed the inquiry. When night came, a feeling of righteous repugnance came over him as he kept in mind the dignity of his royal position, but he was moved also by caution as he considered the future. This could encourage Mithridates to treat him with disrespect, so he was moved to summon him to trial but a different sentiment urged him to send for the beautiful woman as well. In his solitary state, wine and darkness played on the king's mind and reminded him of that part of the letter too. In addition, he was excited by the rumor that someone by the name of Calirho was the most beautiful woman in Ionia. The only reproach the king had to make against Pharnaces was that in his letter he had not added the woman's name. Still, on the chance that another woman might turn out to be even more beautiful than the one so much talked about, he decided to summon the wife as well. He wrote to Pharnaces, Send my slave Dionysius of Miletus, and to Mithridates, Come and defend yourself on the charge of plotting to destroy Dionysius's marriage. Mithridates was astonished and could not imagine what had given rise to this accusation. 
Then Hyginus returned and reported the incident with the servants. So Mithridates, now that he had been betrayed by the letters, began to turn over in his mind the idea of not going up to court. He was afraid of animosity against him and of the king's anger. Rather, he would seize Miletus, kill Dionysius, and ca the cause of his trouble, carry off Calerho, and revolt from the king. Why rush, he said to himself, to surrender your liberty to your master. If you stay where you are, you may even end up on top. The king is a long way away, and his generals are incompetent. Besides, even if he does mark you down for some destruction, nothing worse can happen to you. In the meantime, don't give up the two greatest blessings, love and power. Authority is a glorious winding sheet, and with Calerho beside you, death would be sweet. Even as he was turning these thoughts over in his mind and getting ready to revolt, a message reached him that Dionysius had set up from Miletus and had Calerho with him. The news reached Mithridates more plain than the order summoning him to trial. He wept bitterly over his own misfortune. What have I to hope for now if I stay here? he asked himself. Fortune is playing me false at every turn. After all, perhaps the king will take pity on me. I have not done anything wrong, and if I am to die, I shall see Calerho again. And in the trial, I shall have Charius with me, and Polycharmus. They will speak for me and prove that I am telling the truth, too. So he ordered all his household to follow him and set out from Cauria. He was in good heart, because he did not expect to be convicted of any wrongdoing. So he was escorted at his departure, not with tears, but with sacrifice and festive procession. Now as Eros was dispatching this procession from Caria, another left Ionia, more distinguished, for it contained more conspicuous and regal beauty. Rumors spread ahead of the lady, announcing to all the world that Calerho was at hand, the celebrated Calerho, nature's masterpiece, like Artemis or golden Aphrodite. The report of the trial increased her fame still further. Whole cities came to meet her. People flocked in and packed the streets to see her, and all thought her still lovelier than report had made her out. The felicitations Dionysius received caused him distress, and the extent of his good fortune only increased his fears, for he was an educated man and aware of how inconstant love is. That is why poets and sculptors depict him with bow and arrows and associate him with fire, the most insubstantial, mutable of attributes. He began to recollect ancient legends and all the changes that had come over their beautiful women. In short, Dionysius was frightened of everything. He saw all men as his rivals, not just his opponent in the trial, but the very judge. He ended up, in fact, wishing he had never rashly revealed the affair to Pharnaces, when he could have slept and kept his loved one. Keeping watch over Calerho in Miletus was one thing. In the whole of Asia, it was another matter. Nonetheless, he kept his secret to the end. He did not tell his wife the reason for the journey, but pretended that the king had summoned him to consult him about fairs in Ionia. Calerho was distressed to be taken far from the Greek sea. As long as she could see the harbors of Miletus, she had the impression that Syracuse was not far away, and Chariot's tomb in Miletus was a great comfort to her.